I'm going to, we're going to go ahead and get started because I know everybody's going to have a lot of questions for what's coming to us on January 1st of the coming year, 2018. We have e-filing that will be mandatory for everyone in Illinois, in Illinois, I'm sorry, uh, both attorneys and self-represented litigants. And we have people from the clerk's office here, the administrative office of the Illinois courts, uh, to talk about this transition between now and January so that we're all on the same page. So let me introduce our presenters today. We usually have a podium. We struggle without the podium. <laughs> so Kelly uh, Smelter is general counsel for the, why don't you come on up? Uh, is general counsel for the office of the clerk of the Circuit Court of Cook County, where she handles litigation and legal compliance issues. Kelly began working for the clerk's office in November of 1992, prior to working in the general counsel's office from 2014 to 2015. She was the associate clerk for the Family Law Bureau, which is comprised of the Domestic Relations Division, Chancery Division, and the Law Division. From 1994 to 2014, Kelly was the chief deputy clerk for the Domestic Relations Division. From 1992 to 1994, Kelly served as the assistant to the Bureau Chief for the Civil Division. Kelly received her BS from the University of Southern California and her law degree from the University of Cincinnati. Welcome, Kelly. Thank, Thank you for you. being here today. Our next panelist is Allison Spanner. I haven't met, oh, there you are. Wonderful. You yep, come on up. Works in the, let me put my mic down for you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Works in the Civil Justice Division at the Administrative Office of the Illinois Courts. Allison manages the development of plain language statewide standardized court forms for self-represented litigants, facilitating the work of the Illinois Supreme Court Commission on Access to Justice's Forms Committee, a mouthful, and its 11 drafting subcommittees. She also works on other access to justice policy issues that seek to reduce the barriers faced by vulnerable litigants trying to access the court system. She is a graduate of Chicago Kent College of Law. And our moderator uh, for today is Samira Nazem. Where is she? Oh, there, right here. <laughs> so you, I'll just probably hand you the mic, or do you want yeah. to come up? No, okay. I'll give you the to me. Uh, so Samira is CBS, Chicago Bar Foundation's Director of Pro Bono and Court Advocacy. Uh, she leads the CBS advocacy efforts with the courts for policies promoting access to justice, including policies that make the courts and administrative agencies more user-friendly for people without lawyers. She also leads the CBS pro bono efforts, working with lawyers, firms, corporations, the courts, and pro bono and legal aid organizations to maximize the impact of pro bono work. Without further ado, I believe I will turn this over to you, Samira, and you can lead us through the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, so we have a very full room today, which is wonderful. Can everyone hear, even in the back? Okay. Great. Um, so we're going to start off by having Kelly Smelter from the clerk's office present for a little bit about uh, some of the changes that they're making, um, both with staffing and also with renovating their facilities to make it, uh, to get ready for the e-filing mandate that's coming on January 1st. We're going to do a slight change to the order and the agenda um, because Kelly is here with two members from her team, Janet Hunter and Kathy Sink, who will need to leave a little early. Um, so Kelly will speak, and then if anyone has questions that are specific to the Cook County rollout, um, and to what's happening at the Daily Center and the other buildings in Cook County, they can direct those to Kelly and her team. Um, and then Allison Spanner will speak about some of the statewide policies um, related to e-filing. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kelly. Um, and would you rather stand or sit? Sit. Sit. All right. That's okay. We'll be seated. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yes. Oh, awesome. Okay. So good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure. I know that we have a lot of um, exciting uh, people who are very excited about the Supreme Court's mandate for mandatory e-filing starting on January 1st. So when I was talking to Samira, she asked that I update this group on some of the things that our office has been doing in preparation of this um, mandate. So one of the things that the order um, mandates that our office does is that we provide an area and equipment for self-represented litigants to 
facilitate e-filing, the e-filing process, and also that we provide technical assistance. So with that in mind, what we have been doing is designating area in every single one of our offices throughout the county. Now, just, just to clarify, the mandate is for civil areas of law, all civil areas of law right now. So we're not making these same preparations. If anybody in here is always at 26 in California or working in traffic court, we're focusing right now on just all of our civil areas of law. And we are setting up what we term in our office unofficially is kiosks. So what this uh, little self-represented litigant station will have is a scanner, a um, PC, access to the internet, and um, everything that they need to sit in our office and e-file. And we are also looking into, currently on um, the 12th floor, if any of you practice up there, we have our county division and probate division on one side, and on the other side of the floor is an area that we use for overflow for file space for the civil division, law division, chancery division, and our criminal department. And we're working on renovating that entire space to make it an area where we can have kind of a massive area where um, pro se litigants can all sit together, you know, or sit and get kind of like group help if that's possible. And we're also looking on, and all of this, I might add, is tentative at this moment because we are making these plans, but of course, this is a lot of negotiation with the office of the building, the county, et cetera, et cetera. We're also looking into obtaining um, the area down on the concourse level, which is uh, lower level room 12. That's where our office is currently um, providing training for e-filing classes. If any of you have been down there, we have over 40 separate desks and um, computers down there. So we're looking to obtain that area as well to have it be, if possible, like maybe a um, starting point for self-represented litigants to begin the process. Because as you may or may not be aware, we're looking at several different stages or levels of expertise when it comes to mandatory e-filing with our clients. <coughs> and now we're talking specifically about self-represented litigants because we also have separate, several different levels of expertise with e-filing with attorneys, but we're just going to focus on the self-represented -rep litigants right now. So we know that there might be people who enter our office who don't have an email address. <laughs> <laughs> that was like really good sound effects for a scary movie or something. <laughs> um, so we might have to have like a special area that is just helping people get an email address. Then we might have people who are coming into the office for the first time and if, especially if they're a respondent or even if they're a petitioner, but they've never registered with e-filing and they're walking into our office like they do right now and say, I want to file a case, but they don't know how. So we're looking at um, having areas where we can help people a little bit more and then areas where people who just want to come in and do something and already have an account and know what they're doing can kind of get in and get out. And so those areas we're looking to establish in each of the divisions in the Daily Center. And then, of course, we're also looking at all of our suburban areas as well. We're going to have um, kiosks available for folks there, too. We, um, I have with me, as Samira said, two of the people on our team. Kathy Sink is kind of our office's lead for the infrastructure and wiring and like all of those kinds of projects that need to be done and doing outreach. And then Janet Hunter is our internal pro se litigant kind of expert on what kind of various stations do we need? Because obviously, here's one example, we're gonna need different kind of service uh, services or expertise to help people 
do whatever they need to do because they're just here to file an appearance and get to court today. Like for all of those civil housing cases where people just get served and show up and go straight to court. So those people will have to take a different path than someone walking in wanting to sue their dry cleaner because somebody lost their clothing or something like that. So she's our expert on those affairs. And Kathy has been working and going to many, many meetings with, like I said, facilities management, the county, the office of the building, the electricians and so forth to make sure that we can kind of transition our office into something that we'll be ready for on January 1st. It may or may not be exactly the ideal situation, but we need to get something in place right away. So one thing we're looking at doing, for example, if we're going to have people that are required to mandatory e-file, we won't need so many cash registers in many of our operational areas because people will be paying with credit cards or online payments or however you pay when you e-file. So some of those cashiering stations will be repurposed to be like a little kiosk area perhaps for somebody to e-file. And then we'll also be repurposing our staff. Our staff is going to have to get trained in a very different matter um, manner than like sitting there and just being a cashier versus helping somebody walk through how to e-file or scan a document or something like that. So that being said, those are some of the efforts that we've been working on in our office and um, we are prepared to be ready for mandatory e-filing on January 1st and um, if you have any questions let me know. Um, can you also just talk about the transition between e-filing case management systems? Oh, <laughs> so, uh, sorry. Uh, here. Right. I'm sorry, Samira. Yeah, I forgot yeah. all about that. Sorry. Well, if we're tra I'll just, um, I think we're transitioning to questions, but I will kick off. Well, first by asking the group, how many of you have actually e-filed before? Okay, so you've all seen this website. How many of you know that Cook County is switching to a new e-filing service in a few months? Okay, so most of you do not. So my first question to Kelly will be, tell us more about that process and timeline. Okay, so yes, yeah, Samira so did ask me to touch upon this. So, and I apologize, I forgot. Um, the Right now, our current vendor for e-filing is a company called Olus. And the Supreme Court's order mandates that by January 1st, 2017, all <coughs> Illinois Circuit Courts have to transition over to the statewide Tyler system. So if you've been e-filing right now and coming to our website, and you know it's probably going to be great knowledge base for you, um, come January, uh, I'm sorry, July 1st, we're required to be switched over to the Tyler system. So we are working right now on <laughs> integrating our systems and getting ready for that switchover. We don't know exactly when the drop dead date will be, but it could be before July 1st. We're mandated to do it by July 1st, 2018. I said 17, I apologize. Um, but it could be sooner than that. So we will also, in like some of the areas that I've been talking about on the lower level or in law libraries all throughout the county and um, wherever we can, we're looking to have um, kiosks also where people can watch webinars so that they can get trained on the new Tyler system. And then we're, we've requested that it could be one of those systems where it's not just a rolling tape where you have to watch 15 how to do this, 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 but you only want the 14th one. We're trying to get it so that if you want to know how to spindle a motion, you can just click on that and get instructions on how to do that specific thing. And um, we'll have that available for you. And it's also will be on our website. And you can also go to the Supreme Court's website, I think, right now and look at the Tyler webinars if, if you're interested in doing that. Sure. And Allison will talk in a little bit um, about the Tyler system, which the rest of the state will be on as of January 1st, and Cook will be transitioning to um, during 2018. Um, we're going to turn it over to the audience for questions in a few minutes, but I just want to ask one more to Kelly um, for this group. Um, what can everyone in this room do to help their client population get ready for this transition to e-filing? Hmm. Thank you for asking that. Um, it would be, we're looking to, one of the um, incentives that our office would like to do is to currently get a 
prepare a database of all of our cases where pro se litigants are currently involved and they are not e-filing and send them out some kind of notice in advance saying, you know, come on a certain day, January 1st, you're going to have to be proceeding with your case via electronic filing and what does this mean for you and kind of lay it out in the simplest of terms just to give people notice. And we're, we're thinking about doing a lot of initiatives like that to get people prepared in advance. So if you're dealing with any clients who maybe are not e-filing right now, but they have a pending case, it would be great to get them, if they don't have an email, at least get them an email and get them registered on the system. If you go to the Illinois um, Supreme Court's website, the intent is that once you register, you could use any of the e-filing providers, so you don't have to create a separate username and password for all of the different companies that are going to be available to offer e-filing to people. Another thing that you could do is just if you have um, engagements where you're going out into the community and people don't have a pending lawsuit, but you know they're there for some reason, you could just let people know that e-filing is coming so that if they ever do get sued or plan to file a lawsuit, that they at least are aware of it and they can get registered in advance if possible. No, I think that's great. And to create an e-filing account, a user does need an email address. So that's one thing to keep in mind for, I'm guessing, many of you have clients who don't use email regularly, and so that will be one additional step to using this system. Um, so does anyone in the room have questions for Kelly and her team? Yep, Susan. Um, two initial barriers. I have a number of clients that don't have a credit card. What is going to happen? Are they going to be able to do anything because they don't have a credit card. Um, so that's one. And then the other thing is, how is the whole thing about a fee waiver going to, you have to file a case before you can go see a judge about a fee waiver, and now how does that work with this system? Okay, so I'll repeat that back in case you didn't hear. There were two questions. One, what do litigants who don't have um, credit cards do? And what do litigants who are applying for a fee waiver do? Great questions. Um, so regarding the first one, people who don't have a credit card, maybe they have a checking account and they can make an ACH payment, or we're looking into, and again, this is just we're looking into the possibility of getting in all of our courthouses one of those machines where people can put cash into it and then it will give them just a value card so that you know they don't have to get a visa card or something like that that you know maybe they don't get their full money's worth or they won't ever use again but if they find out that their filing fee is going to be $125 they can get a $125 card in our office that's not set in stone but that is an option that we're looking into unless we just decide to still take cash in every one of our areas which of course is also an option Regarding your second question, that is something that we are also currently working on, and um, some of you may or may not know that the law actually provides that our office should be filing a person's case or an appearance upon the presentation of a fee waiver application. So that means that um, going forward, we're actually working on a process right now with the uh, chief judge's office because we would like it to be a county-wide uh, process, so it's not different in every division and district, um, to facilitate it so that if somebody doesn't have the money to pay and they have, would like to apply for a fee waiver, that they file their new case with their petition for a fee waiver, they get their case number, and then they'll have to come back to court for a hearing on the fee waiver, but they will be getting their case number or they will be able to file their appearance upon the presentation of that fee waiver petition. Currently, when, um, a, per when a litigant wants to challenge service of process, you file a motion to quash service. Under this current system, you cannot e-file a motion to quash service because it requires an appearance. 
Of course, you don't want to file an appearance and submit to the jurisdiction of the court when what you're doing is challenging the court's jurisdiction. Is there any way that either e-file system can be updated to allow the e-filing of motions to quash but not require an appearance to be filed? So, and for anyone who didn't hear, um, the question is specifically about motions to quash where the litigant may not want to file an appearance um, and submit to jurisdiction, shouldn't. Um, but would like to file that motion, which is not currently permitted under the e-filing system right now. And Kelly, do you have any insight as to that question? I do. So when the state of Illinois got rid of special and limited appearances, they made an exception. And you can file your appearance on a case with a motion to quash, and it does not mean that you're submitting to the jurisdiction of the court. So unless you, um, if, if you file other substantial substantive motions or um, other other types of things with that, then you are submitting to the jurisdiction of the court, but not simply if you just file your motion to quash and your appearance. Other questions? All right. Margaret? Uh, I have a question. You mentioned several times setting up kiosks where people will be able to sit and go about doing their business. My understanding is that the domestic violence courthouse, the majority of the kiosks are going to be standing. And my question is, how does that fit in with the court's long-term goals about doing document assembly on site? So they're standing. <laughs> um, so the question specific to 555 West Harrison, <laughs> where the pending proposal is to have primarily standing kiosks rather than sitting kiosks, and how that might impede a litigant's ability to do document preparation on the site um, because it's not a comfortable <coughs> environment to stay for a long period of time. Your question is a great one, and it also raises another issue that I can just let you guys know about as well. But first, to address your question, so I personally am unaware of the uh, plan or the, um, I'm, I forget the phrase that you just used, I'm sorry, but the intent to make all of the kiosks standing at 555 West Harrison. I don't believe that that is the way that it currently is, and I we're not going to make people uncomfortable in any way, and we are um, providing for space for people to, number one, have privacy, and number two, have documents or resource materials next to them. So, you know, we don't want to make it um, difficult. However, if we do find that we need a lot of kiosks in a particular division, we may have to make some of them standing and some of them sitting just so we can help as many people as possible and of course again some people will be faster at the whole process than others um, and we are also making um, specially um, special kiosks in every single division and e-filing area that are ADA <coughs> compliant so I just thought the, the in, that information was received at a presentation by your office one month ago at the domestic violence courthouse so I think it would be useful for us to have the opportunity to continue to talk about that. Yeah, and since Kathy Sink is here and she's working on, um, you know, all of the facilities and the uh, kiosks in every area, do you have anything further to add? Do you know about that, Kathy? A lot of the areas are set up to where there are actual cubicles for people <laughs> and to be able to sit on, but there are some areas, yes, that there are standing machines. And are you aware at 555 if they will be sitting or sitting? Actually, I don't know where that came from because the fact that we are just meeting with facilities management next week out there. Okay. On so, that. so it seems so, like some further conversation. Would be well, good. there is because the fact facilities management, um, one of the reasons why we're meeting with facilities management and the chief judge's office is due to the wiring and connectivity possibilities. Okay. We can only go where the power and data are at. Okay, that's the only place sure. where we can set it up. Um, but yeah, DV court, we have yet to determine. We know we have to put it out there for the civil orders protection, but we really have yet to determine as far as where it's going to go and how it's going to be set up. Good. Sounds like I'm asking at an opportune time. Mm -hmm. yeah, actually, yeah, yes, yes, yes. You know what? That's perfect because yeah. I wrote it down and I will make sure that that is taken into consideration while Thank we do the walk. Thank you. Okay. Caroline? Um, two questions. The first is for those of us who run help desks either in the Daily Center or in the suburban courthouses, will you be providing the help desks with a kiosk so that we can assist the people at the help desk um, with the e-filing process? I think it's something that many of us would rather 
filter into our services then send them off to another location um, and if it's unknown or <laughs> who, who should we contact to talk about that because that's something we were just discussing in our office that we'd like to have a kiosk at our help desk and then the second question is what kind of language access accommodations are being made for those who are not English speakers. Okay. Two questions there. First one, um, how will the help desks, both at Daly Center and at the branch courts, interact with e-filing? Will they have dedicated kiosks that can integrate into the services? And I can answer a small part of that. Um, Courtney, who's sitting over there, works um, with the Justice Court team down in the basement. So for those help desks that are in the Resource Center, we are in discussions to have some e-filing kiosks down in that basement area. Caroline, I know that won't help Seattle's desk at the Daily Center, but that will service the ones in the basement. Um, I will let Kelly weigh in on kind of what the access will be like for the other desks that are on upper floors. Hey, Kelly. And yes. Can I yes. weigh in on that? Uh, first off, the Justice Center downstairs in the lower level, uh, where is that located? Uh, CL 16. It's the Elder Justice Center and the Resource Center for people without <coughs> lawyers. They're in the same space. It's outside of security next to the Starbucks. Yeah, we did look as far as the space and as far as the help desks in the district locations, we are doing another walkthrough with the electricians and facilities management. So I will put that on the list as far as having um, a system set up there. Um, we are, whereas Kelly had mentioned, we are working with uh, the chief judge's office with the law libraries and the uh, Bureau of Technology for the use of all of the law libraries and all of the locations. Um, we are looking for the help desk, usage of the help desk. In some of the locations, we are looking at additional rooms away from the clerk's office to use as pro se centers, registration centers, as far as um, assistance on that. So there's a lot of avenues that we are looking at as far as um, adding. It's like, again, it's based on how the facilities management can get the additional wiring and power. Is it appropriate to contact me directly if we want to help us with your questions about the issue? Sure, you can. Sure, you can. Absolutely. Sorry, and I think there's a second question about language access and e filing. And um, just to address, when you say that um, a help desk would like a kiosk, if you have access to the internet and you can e-file, I'm not certain what it is that you're looking for. You mean like an actual PC and maybe a scanner because your help desk doesn't have that? Exactly. Yeah, right now our help desk, we, we run the adult pro se guardianship help desk on the 12th floor of the Daily Center, mm -hmm. probate clerk's mm -hmm. office. Right now our volunteers help people fill out the pro se forms. They do them by hand. And then, you know, they walk 10 steps to, to file. What we'd like to be able to do is assist them in typing up the forms, getting the PDF ready, or having them have to, you know, sign off and then scan it in. But we don't want to have to send them to another room to do that. Well, I actually love it that you want to help them from A to Z, and that would only benefit our office. So I can see... Um, my colleagues shaking their heads and so I think that that will be a it's great that we're here to meet with anybody who would like to do something like that oh pardon me I apologize is that me oh yeah Mark um, sorry about that um, by Supreme Court rule defendants in eviction are directed directly to the courtroom. Right. Um, so this is a two-part question. One, oh, did I do that? How do you condition okay. it's going to be to ensure that eviction defendants have appearances if court or if they're in the courtroom? And second, can you tell us what happened with the pilot? So there was a, the clerk of the circuit court in the Daily Center had a pilot where they were asking all defendants in one of the 14th floor rooms to go downstairs and file an appearance. And I haven't heard anything about that since the end of Okay, so the questions were specific to eviction court, um, where defendants uh, go directly to the courtroom without filing an appearance ahead of time. And then a follow-up question about a pilot program at the Daily Center that required all defendants in eviction court to file an appearance um, same day. 
Okay, so I can certainly answer that, but I just wanted to follow up and answer the um, remaining question that you had about language access. What are our plans for that? And um, we are working with the chief judge's office and the interpreter's office. And so a lot of, um, when we come to groups like this and any feedback that you have or suggestions or concerns that you have, we've been note noting all of those and entering them on a issue log so that we can brainstorm and, you know, maybe not on day one have a solution, but keep it on our radar that it needs to be addressed. So one of the things we're looking at is a way to um, perhaps, I don't know if many of you are aware of um, some of the efforts that are being made to have certain kinds of court calls for languages and certain divisions on certain days and things like that to help people who speak English as a second language. But along that same vein, we're thinking of if there's a way that we could have people, for example, who speak English as a second language that they can select a motion date and like come in and we can get an interpreter to come and help several people, um, kind of groups of people at the same time because they speak the language and then of course we would be there to help the person with any kind of questions that they may have about the technical assistance. So does that answer your question about the language access? It, I, yeah, it sounds like we have a lot of Work to do. So yeah, that's true. I think that's the theme of today. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we all have a lot of work. Um, sorry, Mark still had that outstanding yes. question about eviction court. Okay, about eviction courts. So um, that is one area where we have identified where people are directed to go straight to the courtroom, and we're going to have to facilitate a way that these folks get a notice with their summons that they need to either be pre-registered to e-file their appearance before they go to court or they're going to have to go to one of our um, centers to file um, e-file their appearance before they go to court. Then regarding the pilot that we had um, to work on that issue of getting defendants to file their appearance before they go to court, um, Janet, uh, do you mind piping in on that? Uh, yes, we did have that pilot in the chief of the civil division, and we, we ran into a couple of snafus because, again, people were historically directed to go straight to the courtroom without not filing an appearance, so there was a lot of hang-ups and staffing issues about sending them back because if they're filing with the 298s and they have to go to the giant judge's office to get the 298s and then come back to court. We're trying to see what we can do prior to them getting to that first court date to file their appearance. So that's what we kind of put that pilot on hold. I just, I just said, it seems like a balancing test then because you want to avoid current default rates by you know, making people think that they have to be a junk community since the previous court. Yes, Janet, do you want to comment on that? Yes. Uh, when will we be able to e Like right now, you can't do anything with an OP case number in the e filing system. When will that change? Or will it not change until we get the new system in place? Um, you can't file an order of protection. You can't e-file orders of protection there, online right no, now. Like you, you, you pick domestic relations, and there's just no like option. Like there's no way for me to type in an OP case number into the e-filing. Yes, yeah, yes, that's true. So there. Okay, when um the chief judge entered uh, the order to allow um the circuit court of Cook County to e-file. There were certain case types and document types at the time that for whatever reason, programming reasons or just it wasn't possible to coordinate it to get it done to be e-filed that were not um, allowed to be e-filed. And I'm sorry, now I'm remembering that civil orders of protection and stalking and all of those were not included in, in the project. <laughs> So we are, um, every document and case type that wasn't, that's a civil case type, that what we didn't have programmed to be allowed to be e-filed back then by January 1st, we are doing the programming right now to make sure that all of those matters can be e-filed. And I just have one follow-up. Uh, with everything moving toward e-filing, are there any plans to give access to e at least look at the electronic record outside of the courthouse? Like, 
I know the recorder's office has something where you can look at the documents. You can't. You have to pay to print them, and they're watermarked, so you can't just like take a screenshot. But it still would be super useful. I know at least for my agency, especially when we're evaluating a case, not have to physically go to the courthouse to look at the record because all our client has is a faxed copy of a carbon copy. <laughs> so if I could just sit at my desk and look up the record, especially since that's how we're storing them all now, that yes. would be amazing. Yes. <laughs> so the question was about online access to court records and case files. That's also addressed in the Supreme Court's order and uh, the notes that come with it. And the idea is that, and maybe you can speak better to this, but um, when all of the circuit courts and clerk's offices in the state of Illinois are connected with the statewide Tyler system, there is going to be a service provided that's called Research Illinois. And um, right now it's contemplated that either just the attorneys of record will have access to cases, um, access to images from remotely, okay. and um, perhaps parties of record. And, or it could be all attorneys, but that all has to be rolled out because, you know, of course, there's all the confidentiality issues okay. involved with, like, looking at those documents. But that is part of the plan. Okay. Any other questions? Ryan? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> once the current system and the new Tyler system, um, or I should say, once the new Tyler system is up, are we still going to have access to all the things that have already filed? Yes. Okay. Yes. When we do our integration, that, that's a good question, and I'm not a technology person. But once we do, we're also... Sorry, let me just repeat it. For oh, I'm sorry. Back. Um, the question was, once uh, Cook County switches to the new system, will you still be able to access documents filed under the old e-filing system? And the answer is yes. All right. <laughs> I wish they were all so short and easy. Okay. Um, here come all the hands. Yes. All right, so the question is, will it be possible to e-file a motion to appoint counsel? I'm going to, to get this wrong, sorry. To be appointed counsel without filing an appearance in adult guardianship cases? And I see Kelly's taking notes. Yes. Um, so this question, a similar question has come up in other divisions. I'm not aware of this one. That's why I was just um, noting it where um, oftentimes there are GALs appointed in domestic relations or child support cases or um, in chancery division there are the judges enter orders allowing certain firms to go straight to special process servers and then these special process servers are going to want to e-file their returns with us without giving them to the firm to do the e-filing to us. There's quite a number of those situations. So we're noting all of those situations because they're kind of exceptions where you're not exactly a party to a case, but you may need to file something on a case, and um, we need to provide for that. So the ones that we know about, we're doing the programming for it, of course, and we always have a conversation with the uh, respective presiding judge of, you know, whichever division to make sure that this is fine, and then if it's across the board, that's it. We talk to the chief judge's office. But um, we are um, doing the programming for all of those kinds of exceptions. So have you ever brought that up before at all with I, anyone I from probate? Okay. Well, I'm happy that you brought it up here because I will note it and make sure that it gets added to the issue log. Susan? You know, in the e-filing class that I went to, um, there was a question raised about, so how do you complete or that you've actually given notification if you're e-filing, and they didn't have an answer, and I'm wondering how that's going to happen, that's an additional kind of step. I mean, when you're, particularly again, from the pro se perspective, it just seems like we're creating more and more 
kind of hoops that they get have to jump through, and it's making it more and more difficult, mm -hmm. particularly when we're dealing with a population that really doesn't have the skills. So here's another problem, and how are they going to be? You've got two pro se's, or you, how are they going to get notification access, and how are they going to be able to prove that? Um, do you have some sense of what that's going to mean for somebody with? So the question is, how will pro se litigants notify other parties and prove notice um, with the e-filing system? Well, um, there. Pro se litigants will still be allowed to indicate that they want to receive snail mail. So this isn't for the initial appearance, but as long as they're not in default, they can still get served documents via mail. If they don't put down an email address to get service, then their service on uh, notice of filings and things like that, notice of motions, is that what you're talking about? It will still have to be through snail mail or any of the other um, ways that you can get service in the Supreme Court rule, like via fax, if they write down that they... Is, are your forms going to be adjusted now then to allow by email? Yes. We, we have been in the process of updating all of our forms to add up to um, a primary email address and two secondary and a tertiary email address, you know, if, if that you want that on a form um, and we're also updating all of our summonses to say things like where it says and you are hereby required to file your appearance this will require that you register and have an e-filing account and you know adding language like that on all of our forms that um, you know we're glancing and we think things like that might be applicable but if anyone knows of any forms that needs need a special update or something that might be off the radar, we're open to getting that information from anyone as well also. Okay, so we are um, running a little low on time and I wanna make sure we have time for Allison, so I think maybe one more question and then for those who didn't get to ask their questions today, um, I will certainly be talking to Kelly again, so maybe you can send them to me or to Angela and we can try to get answers for you. Ryan? Um, for pro se folks, when they go to the data center and they file their case or motion, will they be given any free copies of what they file? Um, at least one free copy, or will there be a charge for those? Because I know right now, if I print something from the online access terminal, it's $2 for the first page and 25 cents for each additional. So for some of our clients who maybe are low income but don't qualify for a fee waiver, Sorry. that's still a little extra, quite a bit. So, um, the question is about getting copies of documents that have been e-filed. Will that be free or will there be a cost of printing those documents so you can take one home with you? There will be a cost of printing documents and um, everybody who e-files something will of course get their electronic copy back so they can print it themselves or have it themselves um, you know, on their account. Unless of course they fill out a form twice or make an extra copy of it. Okay, um, so I want to thank Kelly and her team for um, joining us today. I know there are a lot of questions as we get closer to January 1st, and a lot of this is a moving target and a work in progress. So, you know, certainly if you have questions or concerns, feel free to um, share them with me and Angela, and we can be in touch with Kelly's team about that. Um, we all have a lot of work to do to make this roll out as smooth as possible, and I think we all know there will be some bumps along the way, but, you know, if Kelly's team is working very hard on this issue, and um, we want to do what we can to support them. Um, so with that, I'm going to switch to Allison from the administrative office who's going to talk about some kind of statewide things and will also um, just show you, since I think most people in the room are not familiar with the Tyler defiling system, on what you can expect come some TBD date in 2018. Okay, thank you all. So let me close down that and this is your PowerPoint. Okay. So, all right. So Cook County, as Samira and Kelly just mentioned, transitioning over to Tyler. Uh, Tyler is the statewide vendor. So um, a lot, al already a lot of counties outside of Cook are using this vendor. Um, and it's slightly different in a number of ways from having one singular 
website that you can go to to e-file the way Cook does. So if you go to the Illinois Supreme Court's website, you'll see on the right-hand corner um, a link to e-file, and it says Odyssey e-file Illinois, and that's Tyler's what's called an EFSP, an electronic filing service provider. So um, you see the logo right here, and if you click on that link you'll you'll get here and then there's another link here that says service providers and my understanding is a lot of counties are referring um, based from their website directly to this page so this is the page for electronic filing service providers so you scroll down and we have what is called or what's being referred to as sort of an open marketplace for EFSPs um, so anyone who e-files has the option to select any of these vendors uh, that they can file through. So Odyssey e-file Illinois is Tyler's system, but you can also select file and serve Illinois or green filing or I2 file. And once you create one username and one password, you can go back and e-file with any one of these EFSPs. Okay. So it's kind of probably learn what you like the best and you'll probably return to that several times. So the, the ones up here um, uh, that say free, uh, those are free for e-filing. Uh, the ones below have some additional services uh, that will cost money. So at least in our office, when we're dealing with self-represented litigants, uh, we are going to be referring to Odyssey File Illinois, which is the free service and is Tyler supported. But there's no reason that anyone can't file with any of the other EFSPs that are listed on that website. So this is the Odyssey system, and you have the option to sign in or register initially. So I have already signed in, so I'm just gonna show you the interface. All right, so this will be the dashboard that is um, used once you file, once you log in. So every time you log in, this is what the what it looks like. So you have two options here on the right hand side under new filing. You can start a new case or you can file into an existing case. So if you start a new case, the person who's starting the new case is going to be required to enter some information. So that was a nice little pop-up. I closed it kind of quickly. There are some nice features in Tyler that have some usability. So that said, if you already have a case number, you're going into the wrong part. You should actually be, if you already have a case number and the case is already filed, you should be putting your documents in a, in a different place. So there are some nice um, usability uh, functions here with Odyssey e-files. So you select your location, you select your category, your case type, then you type in the party's names on both sides then you actually um, elect what to file. So if you, for example, choose an adoption, uh, the, the amount that's actually going to be charged is automatically populated here at the bottom. So somebody can know whether or not they feel they can afford that filing. Uh, that's the case with any filing. Um, and then you can also select, if you want to do a fee waiver, you select the waiver option, and you can file your fee waiver along with your other paperwork. So as you go through the process, I'm not going to sit here and bore everyone by typing into this, but um, this is up and running on the Supreme Court's website right now, so you, there's no reason you can't go in and create a username and play around with this. Um, if you do uh, start <coughs> an e-filing process and then walk away, you, uh, it will save under drafts, uh, so it can, it'll show you all your drafts, and then you'll see if your cases are pending, whether your cases have been accepted, if it's been returned for any reason, you'd have to log back in to see that. Um, and then if you choose to do e-service, then that will also um, show here on this dashboard. So that is Odyssey e-file Illinois. <coughs> that is one of many options for an EFSP that you can select or you can advise your clients to select. Um, all right. With that, I'll move into talking about some updates that we're doing for the statewide standardized forms. Um, as you may or may not know, the Illinois Supreme Court drafts forms for self-represented litigants to be able to um, file a divorce, to file, hopefully very soon, file an order of protection, um, 
mortgage foreclosure, a variety of forms, and those are all on the Supreme Court's website. Um, we are making updates to those forms to be ready for e-filing. One initial update that's already been completed is that the forms have been unbundled. You can find individual links to all of the forms on our website. Previously, it was one link that provided somebody with instructions, the getting started, and the form itself in one link, which is, I think, more user-friendly because you, I, I think the form is limited in usefulness. You need to also know how to complete the process, and that's what the instructions include. But clerks, uh, rightfully so, would prefer just to get the one court document. So everything is unbundled, um, and that's already been done on our website. In addition to unbundling, we're changing the signature block to allow for electronic signatures by just the S slash, or slash S slash signature, um, where you can just type the name. That will allow somebody to not have to print out the document to sign it and then file it. Uh, one of the most important updates, of course, on our instructions under what do I do after I fill out this form is notifying everyone that e-filing is mandatory. We also are notifying everyone that there is an e-filing exemption. If you uh, have trouble with e-filing, which I'll talk about in just one second. Um, we are also updating our proof of service. So if somebody elects to do e-service through one of the EFSPs, then our proof of service now allows somebody to check that box. We also allow for emails as well, which we did previously, but that would be the two ways that electronically you might want to do e-service. Um, okay, so the next thing I wanted to talk about is the exemption. So, all right, so um, there is currently an e-filing exemption. So it's under Supreme Court Rule 9C4. And um, it's right here in bold. So anyone can file a motion asking the court to be exempted from <coughs> e-filing if they have good cause. So documents in a specific case by court order upon good cause shown, period. Currently, that's the extent, and that's the extent of the guidance that's provided under rule. Um, my division at the AOIC, along with the Commission on Access to Justice, has uh, put together a proposal that was submitted to the Illinois Supreme Court that is asking for uh, clarif well, it's proposing modifications to Rule 9C4 and adding essentially a comment that describes the circumstances where somebody could qualify for an exemption. Currently, um, and then it also, I should clarify, there's also um, a requirement that an application be used to seek this uh, exemption and the actual application or certification has already been drafted. Um, and the, the reasons in the, uh, let me just advance this here, the things that we have identified in our proposal is good cause um, and that's what we're seeking approval from the Illinois Supreme Court is that you don't know how to use a computer. You, do not have internet or a computer in your home, you have a disability or trouble reading, writing, or speaking in English, you do not have a bank account or credit card, or you need to file an order of protection or a civil note contact order. So that is currently the proposal that's pending before the Illinois Supreme Court. We've been told that they will be reviewing this at, in their November term, so we will hopefully have some clarification as to whether or not the exemption will look like this, and we will be referring our self-represented litigant uh, clients to a generic motion form suite and say you need to file a motion to ask the court, or whether or not um, a, a modification will be approved, uh, and with that also a standardized form. So we're hopefully right before Thanksgiving we'll have some some notification or some clarification on what this is going to look like, but um, but an exemption does currently exist. Yeah. All right. So does anyone have questions for Allison either on the forms or on this proposed um, exemption? <coughs> uh, oh, yeah. oh, I'm sorry, sorry. Margaret. Yes, uh, Allison. Back to the the. Uh, proposed exemptions would, for the OP and civil note contact order debt exemption seems to be different in type as from the others in the sense that it exempts a whole type of cases. Uh -huh. 
is it still envisioned that people would have to file the, the motion or certification as individuals to receive that exemption? So, sorry, the question was specific to the ex proposed exemption for OP cases. Would those individuals still need to file an application, or would that be automatic because it's carving out a <coughs> entire case type? The way that the proposal is currently drafted, yes, there would be some sort of a, a filing that would be required to, to say, yes, I'm filing this type of case, and I should be exempted from e-filing. Does that have to be e-filed? No, no, traditional e -filing. Fantastic question. Does the application to be exempted from e-filing have to be e-filed? No. No. And does it have to be heard by a judge? That is an open question. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, oh, sorry. Um, I was just going to jump in. Yeah, no, go ahead. That is an open question, and I can't answer. We've, uh, that's something that has to be decided by the Illinois Supreme Court. Both options have been provided with a strong preference that it would be uh, a certification, an automatic sort of uh, entry of the uh, exemption, but it's, that's an open question. So, yeah, we know there are going to be a lot of questions about this, and I mean, the answer to most of them will be that we don't know yet, and I can assure you that we and the clerks and everybody really want to know what the Supreme Court does with this, um, and we're going to have a bit of waiting on that. Uh, yes? Um, for civil legal service providers, the system currently lets you just declare that's what you are, and it generates the form automatically. Will the new systems do that as well? Will that be one of the options in the fee section? Not that I'm aware of currently, but that's something I can, I mean, I don't have like the ear of Tyler, but. Yeah, because <laughs> we do. do you yeah. Oh, okay, us? Kelly, yeah, yeah that might be a question for Kelly. So we do, and uh, currently, well, what, what we're proposing, the Tyler system, because it is statewide, can everyone hear me? Um, Olis has been uh, great for Cook County because if there was a way to make something easier, we got feedback from our customers or, you know, our attorney customers that it would be easier if the system worked like this or that, they would reprogram it to make it happen like that. Tyler's a statewide system, so a lot of the things that we're seeing are a little more generic and not quite so tailored to cook. But with, having said that, and again, I'm not a technical person, but when... The Tyler and our system meet and integrate. We're hoping that a lot of the uh, enhancements that we have will be able to flow down. Sorry, I have no idea about what the terminology is, but if you can kind of follow me. Um, but that should be an option in the pay field that you are asking for a fee waiver, you're paying with a credit card, or you're a CLSP, and then you would simply upload your form to show that you're a CLSP if it doesn't automatically okay. create like our system does. Okay. Thanks, Kelly. You're welcome. Hey. Can you talk about um, filing within an organization? So we have a bunch of attorneys, and should they be filing with their own credit cards? or? There's a, there's a, like a pop up that says you know ask your administrator if you already, your your organization already has an e file. So what I do know I, I don't know. Sorry, the question is for organizations with multiple attorneys. Will they all have their own accounts or their own credit cards or what kind of organization wide integration um, will there be? I know that you can register as a firm right. as opposed to an individual. Um, beyond that, I don't know. I don't have any additional information. Um, I do. Kelly. I don't want me to let Kelly answer. <laughs> Kelly, why don't you come back up to the table? You've got um, all the answers. So in our negotiations with Tyler, that's a very common question at a lot of law firms and organizations. And so what we're looking is to have um, each organization have an administrator for the firm or the organization that everybody can file with this firm credit card that's saved online or that you'll each have your you know your permissions like your permissions and restrictions or the level of access that each user can have so that should be an allowable thing that you can have a firm credit card and everybody can use it if ever if it's set up by the administrator to allow everybody to use it okay and that's for other counties right because yeah, well, if you, cr if you register with a username and password with the statewide system, that username and password is usable for every county. 
and you don't have to that's the intent of it is that you don't have to like when Allison said at that first area where you pick your place or something I think mm -hmm. was the question that's the county that you'll select what county you're filing in and then you go to what you're actually filing and every county is listed that currently has the Kyler system so make sure your clients know that Chicago is in Cook County so they can pick the right place. Um, all right, any other questions? Margaret again? <laughs> Sorry, I have become that person, but I thank you for humoring me. Um, I think the question is for both of you guys. I think we're all anticipating that there might be a few wrinkles as this rolls out. And how are you guys planning to monitor the impact on self-represented litigants? Are we looking for like a... I'm concerned about a stark decrease in petitions for orders of protection, but other people might be worried about, like, all of a sudden there are a ton of defaults in landlord-tenant. Are those going to be monitored in, a, like, a real-time basis? I don't want to look at this in, you know, 2020 and say, oh, too bad that happened. So the question is how will um, the AO, the clerks, courts, all the other stakeholders monitor the potential impact e-filing is having on access to the courts for self-represented litigants? Um, Actually, Jill in the back of the room should really answer that, but uh, uh, Allison can do it for her. <laughs> or Kelly. Um, <laughs> um, it's my understanding that this is going to be um, a, I don't know, it wants to say requirement. It's going to be county by county and circuit by circuit. Each individual circuit is going to have to take it upon themselves to evaluate um, something like that. Uh, from our office, um, I would love to hear from anyone if they have any problems with e-filing specifically with self-represented litigants or if they feel that there's been yeah significant decrease in something like that um, unfortunately my division my office only knows that if some if somebody someone like you all in this room reaches out to me um, so I'd like to strongly encourage that and we will then work on on solving that problem but I don't know if you have anything yeah, to add. Do you want to talk about the quarterly data collection that you submit on pro se's? Well, okay, so there's two things. Uh, the first thing is that our office does do statistical reports for the AOIC regarding all self-represented litigants and whatever kinds of information that they have requested from us to track. So we'll be able to do some of that via those statistical reports, but our office is also very focused on all of our post-implementation issues that arise whenever we start a new initiative. And this would probably be a good time to promote um, the two committees that we kind of created through the Pro Se Advocacy Committee. Um, we, um, at a different meeting, we created kind of a um, focus group-ish team for anybody who wants to uh, provide feedback to the clerk's office, and there are members from the AOIC and the Chicago Bar Foundation and some of the uh, chief judge's office, and probably gearing up closer to implementation and then definitely after implementation, it might be a good thing for us to just put something on the calendar to touch base at least once a month to talk about the issues that are arising. This group has also like pre-identified, it's already on our radar, like where are our sticking points right now where customers get frustrated right now with the system? And so we're starting to like create a different issue log for those so that we can prior to e-filing, which is going to raise the stress level for any self-represented litigant, if they're already getting frustrated whenever they go to, you know, room 601, that's an example, that's not true. But, if, you know, if we know that that is a fact and what is the issue there that stymies people, what can we do right now to fix it before we even start e-filing and then to make sure that we monitor those sticking points going forward in case it just gets worse? or if we have corrected the problem. So I think we are um, out of time, and that's actually a nice um, stopping point that January 1st is not the end of this process, it's the beginning of this process, and there will be a lot of work to do, both in the lead up and in the rollout of e-filing. Um, Kelly mentioned that there is a group um, through the Circuit Court of Cook County Pro Se Advisory Committee that is right. <laughs> meeting regularly to talk about some of these um, issues related to self-represented litigants and e-filing. And actually one of the things that came out of that group is this little color handout on your tables 
um, about e-filing. That's a draft version. We're going to work on making sure all that information is correct. But you know, we're trying to think about what are resources we can create to help the public, and um, how can we support the clerks in this pretty mammoth undertaking. Um, so I'm sure we will have many more conversations about these, you know, in the upcoming months and probably years. Um, but thank you to Allison and Kelly for joining us today, kind of letting us know what the state and the county are doing um, to get ready for this this big change. So we get a round of applause. Hi everyone, just really quick, um, we got a couple minutes, and I'd like to um, introduce myself for those of you who don't know. My name is Angela Lanzano, program manager here at the Chicago Bar Foundation. Um, and welcome to another uh, great year of the Legal Aid Committee. Um, on most of the tables, though, maybe not in the back, so if you're really interested, you can come to the front and grab one, or you can ask me for it. Um, we'll, we'll pass it around um, electronically as well. There's a handout about the legislative subcommittee of the Legal Aid Committee. And it's um, kind of a QA and a um, because I think a lot of people have no idea, um, which is understandable. So the idea is each of the CBA's committees, very quickly, um, can have a legislative subcommittee if they'd like. You can ask the CBA to either, there's a few options, one is to um, have a piece of legislation become part of the CBA's agenda, which means that their lobbyists will work on it um, and try and pass that, that piece of legislation. That process happens early in the year, you'll see on the sheet, which means that if you are interested in submitting anything for that, um, you really need to get it into Beth, who unfortunately is not here today, but um, into Beth or myself um, by November 1st. So really start thinking about that right away. <coughs> um, and the other option is that throughout the legislative session, you're going to see bills that are either really great and you want the CBA to take a position in support of, or are really awful and you really want the CBA to take a position in opposition of. That can happen throughout the year, and you again can bring those to Beth or I at any time. Um, and the way that that works is that it goes through the subcommittee, they review it thoroughly, they make a recommendation to the full group and then to the legislative subcommittee of the CBA and then to the CBA's board. As you can imagine, this process takes a little bit of time and so make sure that you know you allow for that time in terms of the process. It is um, can be a little cumbersome. So um, the big question is what types of uh, what types of legislation are appropriate for this group? So we've really had a lot of success in keeping that to civil legal aid. Um, so things that are strictly criminal, that should really go through the CBA's criminal law committee 9.9 um, .9 times out of 10. Um, so thinking about things in that, in that <coughs> way. And, and we know that there's going to be some flexibility for things that affect legal aid clients or that are, um, for example, like quasi-criminal. So that's a good segue for me to talk about some of our initiatives from last year. Um, so if anyone has any questions or, or if you have anything, you have any ideas, please let me know, um, let Beth know, but you can take that sheet um, back and, and think about it. So um, last year we worked on two bills, three bills primarily. Um, the one um, success I'll start with is that um, we um, passed a bill, Governor Rauner signed, um, which changes the Forcible Entry and Detainer Act and the corresponding language to the Eviction Act. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> evictions, um, and it was not as easy as you might think that it was, should have been um, to do that, but we, we were successful. Um, it will be called an eviction order, and um, Allison and her great team, um, there is a standardized form um, that is posted on their website um, right now. It's amazing um, if you've ever seen a forcible entry and detainer of order form or order possession, or it's, I mean, it's night and day. Um, and so I encourage you guys to take a look at that, but that'll be like the real tangible impact of that, I think, is seeing that, that standardized order form, which our legislation makes mandatory throughout the state for people to, to use, and I think that'll be really great. Starting um, when? So, um, January 1. January 1, yeah. Um, so that is great. So that is um, the eviction court. So the other one, and the reason that I uh, mentioned it around this quasi-criminal sense, is that we had an initiative that was part of the CBA's um, agenda um, to reform the court fees and fines um, in Illinois, kind of a, a large reform bill. A lot of these bills take multiple years to get through. They're just they're huge. Um, they're, there's, there's a lot um, of moving pieces. Um, so as you might expect, it did not get through last year, um, but we made a lot of really good progress in educating legislators about the need for this and how it would impact people, um, people's lives and their constituents positively. Um, we are currently working, unfortunately, we have lost both of our um, sponsors to early retirement. 
Um, and so we are uh, working on um, gearing back up for the next legislative session on that one. That one will probably come to you in the November meeting to adopt again um, as part of our agenda. Um, I will say that we had so much success with the eviction court bill that we are looking for other um, simplification efforts, um, language and statutes that you think is just overly um, complex and difficult for people to understand. If you have ideas for that, please let us know. Sometimes that has to happen through the courts, but sometimes it does need to happen through a statute. And so we'll, we're looking to identify um, if we could maybe include one of those bills each year, perhaps, in our, in our work. I think it would be really great. Um, and make everything a little bit more accessible for people, as we've been talking about today. So that's a legislative update. Um, and then really quick, before um, I turn it back over to, to Cliff for any of the other announcements. Yes, Mark, yeah. Do you want to mention that the comment period ends uh, at the end of the month for the... Oh, yes, the comment period for that standardized form, exactly, thank you, Mark, um, ends at the end of the month. So if anyone has comments, um, I've already heard a couple good ones. Um, from people who practice in the area in particular. So if anyone has comments, make sure you check that out online. Um, they don't have to be good ones. Yeah, <laughs> they can be terrible <laughs> ones. Too. I mean, they can be like, you know, constructive <laughs> criticism. Right. <laughs> where, where, where do you where do you access that? Where do you access that? Order? That's all at yeah. Sure, that's on the Illinois Supreme Courts under uh, Illinois, uh, IllinoisCourts.gov. Uh, there's an Access to Justice tab on the right-hand side, and there's forms there. I can actually pull it up here in a second. Um, and then there's a section on our website that, or on the next page that says draft forms um, or forms for public comment, and you can just click on the form and submit the comments that way, or email me directly. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> yeah, I just said any other questions? The other thing is we are looking, if you're interested in being really in the weeds on the legislative subcommittee process, um, we're always looking for people who are interested in being a part of that subcommittee, so just let Beth or I know that as well and that information is on that one pager that's that's circulated.